So okay, hi everybody. Uh, welcome to Cosmo Lunch. And uh, today, first we'll have uh, Martin Loken, uh, who's a PhD student from University of Toronto. Uh, she'll be talking about aligning the cosmic web. Uh, please take it away. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Um, just right away, I'll say I'm not sure how good my hotel Wi-Fi connection is going to be. So um, I may turn my video off if it starts getting shaky. Um, so perhaps uh, folks could let me know in the chat at, if at any point uh, the, the uh, video or the audio starts cutting out. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's nice to virtually meet you all. Um, I am a PhD candidate at University of Toronto in my fourth year. And uh, my supervisors are uh, Dick Bond and Renee Lojek. And I've been doing a lot of work with um, the ACT collaboration and also with uh, dark energy survey data, as well as some other work with LSST. But today I'll be talking about the work with ACT and DES. And specifically the work that I've been doing studying superclustering, both in that data and also in simulations. Uh, so I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, so I'll keep the intro brief. But in general, studying anisotropic elongated structure at a variety of scales uh, holds a lot of cosmological and astrophysical information. Um, in terms of the uh, astrophysical stuff, um, galaxies have been shown to, sort of galaxy properties have been shown to correlate with uh, the filament environment. So the galaxy is closer or further away from the filament that can affect its spin and mass and star formation rate, et cetera. Um, and then of course, for cosmology, uh, the amount of superclustering as a function of redshift uh, does probe the nature of dark energy and dark matter. Um, so here's some very basic examples of very drastically different universes. Um, on the left are some simulations that I quickly ran with the peak patch algorithm which rapidly generates uh, halo catalogs from initial conditions in a predictive way. So it's a lot faster than running end body simulations. And the top uh, panel has no dark energy and the bottom has the kind of typical approximate Planck parameters. And of course the overall amount of clustering is different in both of those because dark energy suppresses the clustering. Um, but in particular with the elongated structure, you can see that there are some clear differences in sort of the length and amount of uh, filamentary structure there with the same initial conditions. Can I ask side. a great question? Can I ask a question? Oh, yes. uh, super clustering, uh, what, is there a definition to it or is this uh, the filamentary structure? Uh, what is super clustering exactly? Right, yeah. So it's the term that we use to describe uh, sort of filamentary structure, but across a really wide range, um, because a lot of times people refer to filaments as the bridges between two clusters. Um, and so that's sort of limited to a particular scale around six to 10 H inverse megaparsecs, whereas, um, you know, a line structure can extend to structures that consist of many clusters um, that go over tens or even possibly up to like 100 megaparsecs. Um, and so referring to the all of that scale range, uh, we refer to that as superclustering. Um, but in a couple of slides, I'll talk about how exactly we define regions of high superclustering by a few uh, field parameters. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, so right, so on the right side here, um, this is just uh, some images I took from the Quixote simulations paper. And uh, it's also showing the difference in filamentary structure between a cosmology that's similar to Planck and then a cosmology with um, most of the parameters varied in particular. Omega matter is quite low. In terms of how we can actually uh, measure the amount of superclustering, we can do so in various components. These are images from illustrious TNG. Of course, we can measure uh, lensing to get the dark matter and various properties of the gas, as well as the galaxy field. In my work, I've mostly focused on the gas. Um, so as I'm sure most of you are familiar with, uh, the thermal synyaev zeldovich effect probes in combination, a combination of the gas density and temperature. And 
this is a foreground effect in maps of the CMB where um, the interactions of cold CMB photons with hot electrons in the universe, which can come from either from galaxy clusters or filaments, um, then causes a shift in the frequency at the position of hot gas in these maps. And so depending on the frequency map being observed, that causes an increment or a decrement in the map. And that's parameterized by the Compton Y parameter here, which depends on both the electron uh, number density and the temperature. And the amount of superclustering of the TSC effect depends both on cosmology, but also on the uh, small scale baryonic feedback processes that are still fairly uncertain today and I know are plaguing a lot of different uh, attempts to measure cosmological parameters today. But overall, we can measure this with maps of the Compton Y from ACT. And these maps have been uh, created by these folks here, Matt Madvacheryl, Colin Hill, and Will Colton. In addition to the gas, we can look at the dark matter density through lensing. Um, this is something that uh, our group hasn't yet approached, but we will do that um, in the future. And what we have done is look at galaxy survey data uh, from the Dark Energy Survey. Uh, we've also done a bit with FOSS and in the future plan to work with the DESI catalogs. So now we get into how do we actually identify regions of high superclustering or strong superclustering. Um, I'll focus first on the galaxy data. So if we take uh, galaxy survey data with um, either you know, spectroscopic or photometric redshifts. In the case of DES data, it's photometric. Um, we can divide it up into different slices in redshift or in co-moving space. And then for different redshifts, uh, make projected maps of the galaxy overdensity field and smooth them at some scale. Uh, the choice of smoothing is very much up to the user and the, the science questions. So in our case, we tend to go for smoothing that will probe the kind of inter intercluster filament scales. Um, <clears throat> but people interested in cluster scales could uh, smooth at smaller scales to look at the anisotropy of clusters. People interested in, in very, very long supercluster scales could smooth the maps much more coarsely. And depending on the smoothing, we can use the Hessian matrix to define various properties. It's basically telling us about the curvature of that smoothed overdensity field. And the eigenvectors give us the orientation at any given point of the structure. And the eigenvalues provide some additional info. In particular, some of the properties that we look for in these fields are the field excursion and the ellipticity. So in this plot here, the white points are galaxy clusters from the DES Red Mapper catalog. And the circles surrounding those points are scaled by the new property. Um, so it's basically a measure of the overdensity um, and then it's with respect to the root mean squared of the field. Then we also have this ellipticity property, which depends on the difference between the eigenvalues and uh, basically scales with the kind of elongation of the field at that point. And so by using these two properties together, we can identify or define regions of high superclustering as regions that pass some threshold in both nu and e. In addition, if we use the specifically ga galaxy cluster catalogs, then we're basically putting constraints on the points we're looking at with three properties. One of them is the fact that there's a cluster there at small scales, so it's a small scale constraint. And then the nu and e properties we define at larger scales. In other words, basically superclustering, we're defining as a place where there's a galaxy cluster surrounded by a large scale elongated overdensity. You might wonder how this changes with scale. Um, so I mentioned that we are mostly interested in kind of the intercluster filament scale. Um, and if you take that typical scale around six to 10 H inverse megaparsecs, and uh, if you convert uh, what you would have to smooth that with, say, a top hat radius to a Gaussian beam, which is what we have done with our maps, that ends up being around a 20 megaparsec full width half max for the Gaussian. 
So that would be the right plot here. And so um, you can see as you look at this structure here, we have the direction of orientation given by the eigenvectors for the map smoothed at that scale, or the, this would be the second eigenvector. And if you move to more fine grain smoothing, that direction of orientation changes quite a bit. So what that's telling us is that the orientation of small scale structure isn't necessarily aligned with larger scale orientation. In particular, it appears to vary quite a bit on very small scales, um, probably due to nonlinear uh, evolution of structure at late times that really changes the direction of local orientation with respect to the larger filaments in which the cluster is embedded. And if we look at that in a little more detail, um, we can ask when you go from scale to scale, how much does the orientation vary with smoothing for a large sample of clusters? So here again is just one example, but now I've plotted all of the orientation vectors on the same plot, um, moving from dark blue, which is for small scale smoothing, to red, the large red arrow, which is for large scale. And you can see that it seems to become more aligned at larger scales, but at smaller scales, the orientation varies quite a lot. And they're almost you know, 90 degrees offset between the red and the dark blue. And so if you look at a cluster sample and you ask, okay, if we successively smooth more and more, then you compare each successive smoothing scale in terms of the average offset in the orientation angle from the more fine grain to the next, uh, more slightly more coarsely grain smoothing, this is the distribution of that average angle that we get. So the smoothing varies quite a lot more um, for the smaller scales. And sorry, the orientation angle varies quite a lot more for the smaller scales. And then for larger scales, it becomes more consistent. And so basically what this is telling us is that the structure becomes more aligned as you move to small to larger scales, which is generally what you would expect from uh, you know, theories of linear versus nonlinear structure growth. You can also look at the dependence of that new parameter on scale. And for this as well, if you look at a cluster sample, it decreases with increased smoothing. And that's because on small scales, uh, clusters, of course, are defined as having some passing some threshold and over density. Um, so, of course, they all have a, a fairly high new on small scales, but those clusters don't necessarily live in larger over dense regions. What we see, in fact, is that a lot of clusters are kind of on the edges of large over densities. And that sort of indicates that maybe there's some flow towards the larger over density but the cluster itself is not necessarily in the center of that. So the takeaways of this is that, again, orientation of structure varies more strongly at smaller smoother, smoothing scales, but becomes more consistent at larger scales, and that high density peaks are less common at larger scales, um, and also they're not necessarily coincident with the location of small scale clusters. After looking at these different definitions of the galaxy field, we can also question how non-Gaussian are superclusters when defining them via these thresholds. So on the left plot here, I have the real data from Dark Energy Survey, then the buzzard mocks, which are post-processed, is their n-body simulations, but then post-processed to uh, mimic the uh, DES data. And then on the bottom, uh, a Gaussian random field with the same power spectrum as the buzzard mocks. And you can see those visually on the right side, the Gaussian random field on the top and the buzzard on the bottom. Um, and then on the red circles and the blue circles are all clusters in the buzzard data, but in the case of the Gaussian random field, they're selected peaks. And they're selected to be of a similar uh, size and, and over density as the buzzard clusters. And so if we look at the field elongation, which is kind of the unnormalized ellipticity um, versus the field excursion, which is that new property, um, we can see that in general, the distributions are different for a Gaussian random field. But in particular, if you uh, apply these thresholds, um, the remaining peaks that pass the threshold are distributed much more high up 
to the to the to the top and to the right of this plot for the real and simulated data. And for the Gaussian random field, they're much more concentrated. Um, and there's also possibly fewer that exceed those thresholds. And so by doing this thresholding, we are defining samples that are quite non-Gaussian in nature, especially for the um, more extreme points. And you can kind of see that by looking at the fields on the right. Uh, if you look at the you know, blue selected regions in the Gaussian random field, um, and you look at how they're clustered, they uh, kind of appear more isotropic around that central point, versus if you look at the buzzard ones, they appear more elongated. I'll come back to, in a moment, how we can then use uh, this knowledge and these thresholds to measure how non-Gaussian our ultimate signal is when we look at the signals from superclustering. So how can we actually measure the signatures of superclustering in maps? I've talked a lot about the galaxy data and how um, we can get the orientation and certain properties and identify regions of strong superclustering. And once we have those regions, we can then apply that to basically any map that we want to do oriented stacking. So in general, stacking is used to um, augment the signal to noise in noisy maps. Um, it's done a lot with the TSC effect um, because as you can see from this image of the real act Compton Y map, um, it's quite noisy when you compare it to this image from the buzzard simulations where you can see those halos in, in very clear detail. And so people do this a lot, you know, stacking on clusters to uh, bring out the signal to noise on the central stacked cluster. Um, and uh, that because it, the signal in the center is stacked and the noise elsewhere averages down. And it averages down as root n, where n is the number of images being stacked. But if you do this uh, in an unoriented way, then all of the surrounding structure, all of the uh, hot gas that's in filaments and the superclusters around your stacked objects uh, just gets washed out and totally isotropized in the final stack. And so what we do is we stack clusters in an oriented way where we use the information from the galaxy field to orient each component of the stack. And that brings out signal to noise on the extended surrounding structure. And so what this looks like is something like this. What I'm showing here is uh, combining multiple stacks from multiple redshift slices, where each stack has been res rescaled to the same physical uh, size and then is being overlaid. And you can see that not only do we have this you know, super saturated region in the center where the stacked clusters are, but we also get this excess along the horizontal axis here, which is uh, aligned with all of the uh, orientations from the galaxy map. And here it shows the cumulative number of clusters. So for this particular GIF, uh, we're stacking over 4,000. In terms of then how to quantify the signal, um, we can break it down into the multifold moments of the stack and the m equals two and four moments. Um, and you could, you could go onwards beyond that, but they get quite noisy. Um, these anisotropic components are what we're interested in measuring the profile of going out from the center of the stack. So these images can be break, broken down like this, where the cosine component is what we will actually plot because it's what's integrating over the horizontal stack axis. And then the sine term basically ends up as a noise term. In the n equals four here, I'll just point out that of course the actual stacked image doesn't have this extra vertical uh, component. And so when doing the integration, um, this, this moment, you, you end up integrating over noise in the vertical part. And this here is just showing a reprojection of that, uh, of that moment into the uh, vertical and horizontal. Um, and so that's why for m equals four, the signal ends up being noisier. So coming back to the non-Gaussianity of superclusters, um, and I also just going to try to check the time. I can't actually see the time on my laptop. So um, if anyone can let me know how much is left, that would be great. 
you have like all 10 minutes but then like uh, this is plus questions so yeah so five minutes and then five more for questions or uh, yeah you can i mean yeah. depends on how many questions but yeah you can go ahead for some yeah five to eight minutes okay thanks so i'll try to finish up soon so coming back to the non-gaussianity question um we can stack the points in the buzzard simulation and the points in the Gaussian random field for both all peaks, all clusters versus the thresholded peaks and clusters that you know, surpass our definition for supercluster regions and then compare them. And so if we look at just the M equals zero component of such stacks, um, you beyond you know, the central cluster area, uh, they're very consistent. So the solid and the dashed lines are consistent with each other in both the non-threshold and, and threshold cases. But this gets more interesting when we look at the anisotropic components. So for M equals two, um, again, fairly similar when you look at all peaks, but when applying this thresholding, we get quite a large boost in the signal from the simulations versus the Gaussian random field. And in M equals four, this is even more true. Um, and in this case, we get basically zero signal from the Gaussian random field, and then uh, some signal for all, all clusters and more for the threshold of clusters. And so basically what this is telling us is that there are many more high superclustering regions in a realistic non-Gaussian lifetime universe. And that yields a stronger anisotropic TSC signal in general. And then in particular with the M equals four, um, because this is only present in the non-Gaussian stacks, this is kind of a clear signal of non-Gaussianity. And you can think of it as measuring how squashed the filaments are because it's integrating over a smaller angle around the horizontal axis. So applying all of this to the real data, these are the results that we got from our recent paper. So in the red are 5,500 stack clusters from DES and stacking the ACT Compton Y map. And then the blue is 1,000 clusters that remain after applying uh, nu is greater than two and E is greater than 0.3 as our thresholds for high superclustering. So in the M equals two component on the left here, these profiles show that um, in general, uh, in buzzard, of course, we see this smooth signal. And then the round points are the actual ACT cross DES data. And they have a clear signal in both the non-thresholded and the thresholded regions. The triangles are the binned buzzard data, just to make a direct comparison with the same binning. And they're in very good agreement. Um, this, the significance of this detection is similar in both cases because the sample size is reduced um, for the blue points. And so although you end up getting a higher signal, it's also higher noise. Um, but in general, this represents a three and a half sigma detection of large scale anisotropy around clusters. And of course, this is expected because we know that clusters live in, in filaments in the cosmic web, um, but it's a neat proof of concept for using this uh, method as a probe of filamentary structure. On the right, the M equals four signal um, is somewhat non-zero, but it's not uh, high enough to be considered a significant detection. But we hope that with expanded data, we will be able to measure it. And so to briefly touch on some of the improvements we expect, from expanded data from ACT. Uh, the Y map that was used for those previous results only existed in this region here called Deep 5.6. And the new Y map is uh, outlined here in this larger blue. And you can see that that uh, overlaps with almost all of the DES data, which is shown in the red and the black points. So this is something like 10 to 11 times larger area and therefore will increase our signal, signal to noise quite a lot. So compared to the previous results, we have around 60,000 clusters in this whole area, uh, which will lead to a greater than three times improvement in signal to noise. And so we can expect detections at around 11 sigma and M equals two, and four and a half sigma and M equals four if we use all of these clusters, which is great because that's again, the, uh, the signal that really shows signs of late time non-Gaussianity.
In addition, we can make some uh, quality cuts, cuts with the, the new data um, due to the expanded nature of it. Um, and if we do those, we would get uh, even better signal to noise. With that new data, we hope to be able to measure the evolution of the signal with cosmic time. So from redshifts one to zero, given the redshift extent of the DES data. This is an example of what that looks like with the web sky simulations. And we do expect to be able to measure this change in the signal from the expanded data. And we're also interested in looking at the gas to galaxy relationship in the anisotropic components of the stacks and using this to move towards a model of anisotropic bias, basically asking uh, with given the presence of galaxies and filaments, what is the gas response to that? And is it different in filaments and uh, in non-filament? So in conclusion, uh, I discussed how these field curvature-based measures can be used to identify filometry structure across a wide range of scale, and also to identify unique regions of extreme superclustering. I showed how anisotropic structure becomes more aligned at larger scales, and discussed some new methods of identifying non-Gaussian structure in the late time universe. I also showed how uh, we use this on real data to get a three and a half sigma detection of extended anisotropy and the thermal energy content of superclusters, including a boost to that signal from doing the thresholding of, uh, that we've defined using the galaxy data. I discussed how the expanded data will uh, increase our significance by around three to four times and how with this new data, we'll be able to make measurements of the evolution of the signal with redshift and of anisotropic bias between the gas and the galaxies. In the future, we hope to expand these methods to search for the signals of the gas in the warm hot intergalactic medium that's been blown out of halos. We also want to use uh, hydrodynamic simulations to test how different feedback, especially AGN feedback, impacts the thermal energy and isotropy to try to uh, get at how the baryonic uncertainties um, might affect how much cosmological information we can get out of this. And finally, ultimately, we'd like to figure out how the oriented signal varies with cosmology, for example, W, or even possibly signals of primordial non-Gaussianity. And for this, we would use either the web sky peak patch simulations uh, and or the Quixote simulations. All right, so that concludes my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions if we have some time. Uh, thanks for the talk. Yeah, let's all clap remotely. Yeah, if there are like one or two quick questions, we can take them now or otherwise we can discuss them later. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, so I had like a, I mean, so so uh, like the the buzzard mocks like they use some semi-analytic prescriptions, and what you are all showing is like those uh, prescriptions like agree well. Uh, uh, like I I thought like they include some semi-analytic prescriptions for how like the extended tidal field can affect the the orientation of the galaxies. Uh, and in um, your work, yeah. I guess uh, I mean at least for the gas, it seems like these agree uh, with 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 the real data. Right, so um, I'm actually not sure about the tidal field in Buzzard. Um, I know that they use a full and body simulation. I mean, in the web sky simulations, they do use this uh, um, kind of rapid predictive algorithm based on the tidal field as the initial conditions. Um, but yeah, either way, there's obviously lots of um, prescriptive stuff going on there in how they produce galaxies. And then also what, what we've done is actually take the Halo catalog from Buzzard and WebSky and just paste it on um, TSC profiles onto the halos. So in these simulations, there is no gas in the warm hot intergalactic medium. There's no gas that's been like blown out of halos. And so one of the things we wanted to see was whether we could 
detect you know an excess in the act data in terms of that the signal with respect to the simulations that don't have that in it um, but right now the error bars are too large to detect that amount of signal um, it's going to be much lower and probably wouldn't be doable even with the expanded data um, so that we'll have to wait for the future or we also have some ideas of how to improve the signal to noise ratio um, by, for example, stacking on all of the galaxies instead of the clusters, which would give us a much larger sample. And then we might be able to see those uh, discrepancies from the, the gas that's blown out of halos. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Any other question? Right now they agree well because of the large air bars. Mm -hmm. uh, Jamur, go ahead. Hey, good to see you again. Um, so I might be thinking of this incorrectly and correct me if I am, but it seems to me that when you do this, um, I guess, aligned stacking, where you don't just stack cluster on top of cluster, but you're orienting themselves in a certain way in order to keep the um, features that aren't necessarily the cluster themselves and prevent them from isotropizing. I feel like there might be some kind of bias coming from that, right? Implicitly uh, in, in the same. Way. So if you only care about the position of the cluster and you say they're like by themselves or somewhat isotropic, then fine. But if you're aligning the material that's nearby the cluster in a way that's specific to prevent it from being washed out, like, I don't know, maybe it's just the science question itself and it probably wouldn't really matter. But I just worry that like the structure around the actual cluster isn't necessarily the way you think it looks because you're doing that procedure. Or is that just not something I, I should I think worry about? I, I think I understand your concern. Is it that it the concern would be if you're aligning the same, if you're using the same information to orient as to stack, then you could be aligning on noise. Is that the concern? Yes, I guess that's one okay. way to phrase it well. Right, yeah, absolutely. So that is something that we've thought about. Um, with the way we're doing it right now, because we're getting the orientation information from the galaxy field, and then we're stacking the Compton Y map, um, the noise in the Compton Y is totally uncorrelated with the noise in the galaxy maps because they're from completely different instruments. And so um, that's a good way to avoid any issue of, of biasing the signal by that. It is something we have to be concerned about, though, with the galaxy data itself. Um, so I mentioned how we want to look at the relationship between the gas and the galaxies. And to do so, we would be stacking on the number density field of the galaxies themselves. And then you have to worry about getting your orientation on the same field as you're getting your signal, um, which I think is your concern. And so, yeah, for that, what we're doing is we're splitting the galaxy data um, into, you could do like half and half, half for alignment and then half for orientation to basically mitigate that effect of, of biasing your signal by um, overestimating the signal because you're aligning on basically noise rather than real structure. Hopefully that's clear. Thanks for the question. Okay, we can move on, I guess, uh, to case, okay? Yes. Uh, can you share your screen? Okay, yes. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, the second talk would be by Kesuke Enomata, who's a postdoc at the University of Sh Chicago, and he'll be talking about traces of a heavy field in uh, gravitational waves. Uh, so please take it away. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm Kesuke Enomata. Um, I'm a postdoc at the University of Chicago. Um, yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Um, I'm very happy um, to be here. Yeah, actually, I'm in IS now. Um, anyway, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about my recent work, whose title is Traces of a Heavy Field in Gravitational Waves. So grab, yeah, this kind of gravitational waves are induced during the inflation. Okay, so now let me show you the overview of this work. I discussed a situation where large gravitational waves are produced during the inflation. This is a schematic picture that I consider, so I consider a spectator field which starts to oscillate during the inflation. So in this case, the spectator field fluctuations get amplified significantly because of the parametric resonance and the amplified scalar field fluctuations induce large gravitational waves. So this is the gravitational wave spectrum 
Yeah, so I will explain uh, so this later. Okay, so this is the overview of this work. Okay, so now let me begin with the introduction. So since throughout this work, I'm going to focus on the gravitational waves induced by scalar perturbation, let me explain a little bit about scalar perturbation in cosmology. Um, scalar perturbations are one of the most important quantities in cosmology because scalar perturbations are origins of many things. For example, large scale structure, symbian isotopy is like from scalar perturbations. From the observations, we already know the amplitude of scalar perturbation on large scales. So this is a power spectrum of curvature perturbation large scale. And scalar perturbations originate from the vacuum fluctuations of field during the inflation. So scalar perturbations have a lot of information on the early universe. That's why scalar perturbations are very important in the context of cosmology. Now, let me explain the gravitational waves induced by scalar perturbations. In the conformal neutron gauge, metric perturbations can be expressed as this. I neglect the anisotropic stress. In that case, the scalar perturbations can be written as this. And this is a tensor perturbation, which described, which corresponds to the gravitational waves. And this is Einstein equation. And the Einstein tensor and the energy momentum tensor can be expressed as this if we take into account up to second order scalar perturbation. Second order means here the square of scalar perturbations. And substituting these expressions into this Einstein equation, we finally get the equation of motion for tensor perturbations. Um, so this is a tensor perturbation equation motion and the point is that right hand side comes from the second order scalar perturbations. The expressions become like this. So for example, during the inflation, the source term can be ex expressed with the scalar field fluctuations. And after the inflation, this can be expressed with the gravitation potential. Point is that scalar perturbation can induce gravitational waves at second order in perturbation. And uh, so I'm going to focus on this kind of gravitational waves. Okay, so now let me explain when this kind of gravitational waves are induced. Scalar perturbations can induce gravitational waves during and after the inflation. This picture shows the evolution of the scalar perturbation. At first, scalar perturbations are inside the horizon. At some point, scalar perturbation exit the horizon. And at some point, inflation ends. And after a while, the scalar perturbation re enter the horizon. Gravitational waves can be produced um, before or around the horizon exit and after the horizon or around the horizon entry. So there are many papers that focus on the gravitational waves after the inflation, like during the radiation dominated era. Um, yeah, so when the scalar perturbation enter the horizon. But in this work, let me focus on the gravitational waves induced during the inflation. And before moving on to um, my work, let me uh, introduce a little bit about the previous works. So there are many sources of gravitational waves during the inflation. I think the most famous one is the quantum fluctuation of tensor field. These gravitational waves are related to the energy scale of inflation, and this is a target of B mode observation of CMB. And also, if the first order phase transition occurs during the inflation, bubbles are produced and the collision of bubbles can produce gravitational waves. So there are many papers discussing on this. And also, if the gaze field have, coup have coupling like FF phi FF tilde, um, gauge field uh, can be amplified um, because the one of the helicidal mode of gauge field becomes tachyonic, then yeah, the gravity, sorry, gauge field uh, is amplified and the uh, large gravitational waves can be produced from the amplified gauge field. And as I mentioned, scalar field can be source of the large gravitational waves. Um, so in usual case, the scalar perturbations are small. So the second um, induced gravitational waves are not so large, but 
if the scalar perturbations get amplified by some mechanism, the large gravitational waves are produced. For example, the scalar uh, field has a very, very small sound speed. In that case, the um, normalization of the scalar field becomes large uh, inside the horizon, then the large gravitational waves can be produced. Also, if we consider the oscillatory features in the potential sound speed, so this is a schematic picture of the potential. So in this case, the scalar field fluctuation get amplified resonantly uh, because of the parametric resonance. Then amplified scalar field fluctuation can induce large gravitational waves. Also, if the um, scalar uh, field trajectory is bent at some point, so the field experience a rapid time field trajectory, the scalar perturbations get amplified and the large gravitational waves can be produced. And uh, in this work, uh, I propose a new case where the large gravitational waves can be produced during the inflation, which is associated with the oscillation of a spectator field during the inflation. Okay, so now let me move on to the main section of this talk. So first, let me explain the situation that I consider. Again, so this is the situation. Um, so I consider a spectator field which start to oscillate during the inflation. And as a fiducial potential, I consider this kind of potential. Um, so I don't assume any interaction between infraton and the spectator field. And this is the infraton potential, but the um, this form, uh, this potential form is not so important uh, because the large gravitational waves can be, it's produced by the spectator field fluctuation. So the most important part of the potential is this. So this determines the shape of the potential body. And uh, I, as a fiducial example, I take um, alpha lactate type potential as this. And I put, I post this condition uh, because this field um, is expected that field. Okay, so in this case, the parametric resonance occurs. And uh, so here, let me explain uh, what the parametric resonance is. So I think that uh, one of the most famous example is a swing. So if uh, some quantities follow the master equation, this, and the uh, frequencies of the quantities and frequencies of the modulation match the quantity growth uh, grows exponentially like this. So in your setup, the field fluctuation, so spectator field fluctuation follows this equation and the effective mass is defined as the second derivative potential. And if the effective mass oscillates, the perturbations on the resonance scale grows exponentially, like this case. Like uh, if effective mass uh, oscillate like a cosine, then the first band corresponds to this scale. And uh, finally, the universe expansion stops the exponential growth. So let me show you the numerical result. So this. Um, left figure shows the evolution of the quantities. So again, so this is a situation. So spectator field st starts to oscillate during the inflation. So this blue line shows the background value of the spectator field. And the x-axis is the e-fold. And the n0 means the time when the um, spectator field crosses the origin for the first time. So at some point, spectator field starts to oscillate like this, and the uh, oscillation amplitude decreases due to the universal expansion. And this line shows the uh, evolution of the effective mass, and the dotted line shows the negative mass. So first, the mass is negative because I consider the concave potential. And the once the spectator field starts to oscillate, the effective mass also starts to oscillate like this. And this line shows the um, spectator field fluctuation per spectrum. And the range line uh, is the peak scale. So first, the peak scale perturbation grows exponentially, but at some point, the resonance stops 
And uh, that's, this stuff comes from the two effects. One is the decrease of the effective mass oscillation amplitude. So we can see that the amplitude of the mass oscillation uh, decreases as time goes by. This is due to the inverse expansion. Also, the, we need to be careful about the change of the physical scale. I mean, the, even if some scales are within resonance scale, that they can go out of the resonance scale once if we take into account the universe expansion because physical scale evolves as time goes by. So due to these two effects, the resonance stops at, at some point. And right figure shows the snapshot of the peak scale, uh, sorry, um, the snapshot of the field fluctuation of power spectrum. And we can see that there is a peak on here. So this is a resonance peak, peak scale. And uh, for comparison, I also brought the smaller mass case. So in this case, the peak becomes smaller. Um, this is because if we consider smaller mass, the resonance stops within a few oscillations. So in other words, if we consider larger mass or uh, more rapid oscillation, then the resonance becomes longer. But if we consider a too large mass, uh, the perturbations becomes too, too large and the perturbations becomes uh, larger than background value. In that case, we need to be careful about the back reaction problem and uh, uh, we cannot use the linear theory in that case. And uh, this kind of resonance is often discussed in the context of preheating so after inflation, in particular uh, in the context of hybrid inflation. Um, so even in that case, the scale perturbations get amplified and the large gravitational waves can be produced from the amplified scale perturbation. Uh, but in, in this work, um, I focus on the gravitational waves induced during the inflation. So that's a difference. Okay, so using this result, I calculate the gravitational waves. So red figure shows the gravitational wave spectrum. Um, so this is the equation of motion of tensor power patient. Um, this is a source term. And uh, this blue line is the main result. So gravitational waves induced during the inflation. And these lines shows the sensitivities of future projects such as the CIGO and the BB BBO. And this black line shows the first of the gravitational waves. Um, so this is from the quantum fluctuation of tensor perturbation, and uh, this is directly related to the energy scale of inflation. And I also brought the gravitational waves induced during the radiation dominated era. So as I said, scalar perturbation can induce gravitational waves even after the inflation. So when they enter the horizon, the scalar perturbation can induce gravitational waves. So for comparison, I brought the, such kind of gravitational waves. So from this figure, we can see that the dominant contribution comes from the uh, gravitational waves induced during the inflation. And uh, I also mentioned that the peak scale is different. I mean, so this is the peak scale of spectator field fluctuation. And uh, this is the gravitational wave peak. So this difference comes from two effects. Uh, one is the red shift of gravitational waves. So once gravitational waves are produced during the inflations, they get red shifted until they exit the horizon. So this means that if the uh, gravitational waves are produced on small scales, on smaller scales, they spend more time until get out the horizon. And uh, the other effect comes from the scale dependence of gravitational wave production itself. So for sub-horizon modes, the left-hand side can be approximated as this. So if we consider smaller scale gravitational waves, so which means the larger K, the induced gravitational wave becomes smaller. So that's why the gravitational wave peak is close to the horizon scale at the production. And the right figure shows the curvature power spectrum. So that this decrease uh, comes from the, um, um, the total energy 
uh, change of the total energy um, because the energy density of the, um, how should I say, so um, potential energy of spectator field decreases um, as decreases as time goes by once they start to oscillate. And uh, the point is that so there is a peak here. So this peak uh, comes from the spectator field fluctuation. Um, in terms of potential, that there is no interaction uh, between the spectator field and the flatter, but they are coupled uh, through gravitational interaction. So this is the um, equation motion for the field fluctuation. So point is that right hand side uh, comes from the gravitational potential. Uh, sorry, so delta phi j uh, means a phi or chi, I mean inflaton of spectator field. So they are coupled through gravitational potential. That's why the um, inflaton perturbation inherits, partially inherits the uh, spectator field fluctuation. So that's why there's a peak here. Okay, so finally, um, let me um, mention some necessary condition for large gravitational waves in this setup. Um, first, oscillation time scale must be short enough compared to the Hubble time scale. This is obvious. Otherwise, the resonance stops before the perturbations get amplified significantly um, due to the universal expansion. So in short, the spectator field must should be heavy enough. But oscillation time scale must not be too short. This is related to the energy conservation law. Um, so this is the energy density of field fluctuation. So this is just a rough estimate, um, but this can be written approximated as this. And uh, this energy must be smaller than the potential energy of the spectator field. The shorter oscillation time scale leads to a smaller peak scale, which means the larger k-peak, um, so which leads to the stronger upper bound on delta chi. So this means that the gravitational waves cannot be large if we consider too small scale, um, too small peak scale. And uh, related to the second condition, delta V over V0 must be large enough. Delta V is the spectator field potential energy and the V0 is the inflaton potential energy. Once we fix M chi over H, the M chi is the mass of spectator field. And uh, so this delta V over V0, um, which can be approximated as this, mainly determines the initial amplitude of the spectator field background field. So this uh, becomes upper bound of the field fluctuation. So um, delta V over V0 must be large enough. Finally, the potential for mass to cause oscillation of the effective mass. As a fiducial example, I consider uh, alpha attractor type potential. But even in the Hilltop type potential like this, um, this kind of resonance can occur during the oscillation. So um, yeah, so this kind of resonance occur in that case. And uh, this condition can be relaxed if the spectator has an interaction with other fields. For example, if we consider this kind of interaction, um, oscillation of the chi spectator field leads to the oscillation, effective mass uh, leads to the oscillation of the effective mass of car phi. So um, fluctuation of car phi uh, can get amplified because of the parametric resonance. So even in that case, gravitational waves can be large. Okay, so now let me summarize my talk. Um, I have discussed a case where large gravitational waves are produced during the inflation. And uh, this is a situation that I consider. So spectator field starts to oscillate during the inflation. In that case, the scalar, sorry, uh, spectator field fluctuation uh, get amplified uh, because of the parametric resonance. And the amplified spectator field fluctuation uh, induce large gravitational waves. So this uh, this is a result, and uh, this kind of gravitational waves could be investigated by future observation, such as this cycle and BBO. And uh, this kind of gravitational waves could be um, could be a detective traces of a heavy field that is not coupled to any other fields. I think this is uh, one of the interesting points of this work. Okay, I stop here. Thank you.
Okay. Uh, thanks, Kesuke, for the great talk. Uh, let's all clap. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, questions for Kesuke. So I, I, I was wondering, this spectator field, um, by construction, you are not making it uh, have anything to do with the scalar fluctuations, right? But, how many? Uh, yeah, just yeah, only one. Yeah, I just assume the only one spectator field. Yeah. But 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 it's not. Uh, it doesn't produce uh, the scalar fluctuation. It's not coupled to curvature fluctuations. Yes. Yeah, I don't is, assume is that. There a, is, is there a scenario in which you would amp the, 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 it would be coupled a little bit? In any case, this is happening on small scale. So probably you can get away with. Uh, is producing some small scale uh, scalar fluctuations, per, perhaps some primordial black holes or something. Uh, yeah. Are there some more complicated situations like that? Yes, yeah, I think that's a good point. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's that could be a good future. But yeah, I think uh, if the, there is a coupling between the spectator field fluctuation and the inflaton, yeah. So in that case, the curvature perturbation can be enhanced, yeah, because the yeah, I think there's some papers. Yeah, there are some papers that discuss kind. Yeah, discuss such kind of scenarios. Yeah, I think yeah, but yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's a yeah interesting yeah point. Sorry, maybe I had a a question. Um, should should one so you, you discussed that you you fix uh, if I remember the Newtonian gauge mm -hmm, mm -hmm. calculation. Is yes. there any worry about? I know that there are a lot. There is some literature on the gauge dependence of the induced gravitational waves at second order, and is is there some uh, problem that one can has to worry about or in this scenario as well? Or uh, yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, but I naively think, um, yeah, this is just my guess, but yeah, naively think the gauge dependence is not so important. Yeah, at least uh, after the inflation, the neutron gauge is a good gauge to calculate the gravitational waves. And uh, um, in this case, the perturbations exit the horizon. And uh, I think, yeah, gauge issue is not so, how should I say? Um, I think there is no serious gauge issue in that case. Yeah. Yeah, but this is just, yeah, my guess. Yeah, but at least, uh, yeah, neutron gauge is a good gauge, at least uh, to calculate the induced gravitational waves. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I, I had a nice question, like when you showed your, uh, like these limits with Desigo, uh, like, mm -hmm. do you have uh, freedom in your model to like overlap with LIGO or LISA? Like you showed some. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's a good point. And actually this uh, result is crossed to the upper bound of this scenario. So um, mainly upper bound comes from the this one, I mean, the energy conservation law uh, puts some upper bound on the fluctuation. Um, so roughly speaking, the energy density of the field fluctuation cannot be larger than the uh, original energy potential, yeah, spectator field potential energy. So uh, now I tune the parameters to make the gravitational waves close to the upper bound. So um, at least in this potential, so in this alpha flux type potential, it is a bit difficult to, um, yeah, make these gravitational waves larger, um, yeah, so that yeah, these gravitational waves could be investigated by the yeah, this or some other, yeah, projects. Yeah, so it is a bit difficult to increase gravitational waves, at least in this potential. But if we consider different potentials, um, yeah, this kind of gravitational waves might be, yeah, large enough to be investigated by the yeah such as lisa or something like that okay yeah makes sense okay thanks i had another question so if uh, if uh, so here you are producing the the gravitational waves from second order effects during inflation 
if this um, uh, ex spectator field was also coupled to the curvature fluctuations, then uh, you had the chance of taking those curv small scale curvature fluctuations and creating um, the gravitational waves at second order after inflation. Is there any easy way to know which one is going to be bigger or is it obvious that during inflation is more efficient than, uh, I've never thought about it, after inflation or the other way around, something like this? Um, yeah, that's a good point. Mm. Okay, roughly speaking, the um, gravitational waves induced after the inflation uh, is the, okay, the order of the uh, gravitational waves is very, simple um ph is nearly equal to the p theta squared so um if we want to compare so these gravitational waves um yeah we can um, yeah we have to calculate the curvature perturbation so we, we we need to know the amplitude of curvature perturbation so um yeah at this point i i i don't i have no idea uh how to yeah, easily compare how to easily know yeah which gravitational waves are bigger. Yeah, but at least for example, um, so we can see this small peak here and that this peak is here. So this kind kind of gravitational is very small, and uh, yeah, so this is just because uh, there is no interaction uh, between infrared and the spectator field in the potential. Um, but yeah, I think yeah we, we need to calculate coverage of perturbation at first.